fantastic. But I start tonight with one of my heroes, and you know that if you've listened to me before. His book is out today. His life has been quite incredible in many ways. A dozen boxing towels in one life, and now in one fabulous book. He is Britain's most successful ever amateur boxer, and that's in the Guinness Book of Records, and it can never be beaten. He had the world quite literally at the end of his size 10 pony boots, and he always wore those pony boots. And then, well, you've got to buy the book and find out. I'm going to talk to the man behind No Place to Hide, How I Put the Black in the Union, Jack. It is, and I should have a drum roll here if I had one. It's Errol Christian. He joins me now in the studio. Good after. Good evening, Errol. Good evening to you, sir. Good evening for, to you. First of all, get a bit closer to the mic, big boy. Now, for Errol, what, you've been all over pu publishing this book. You got driven seven hours to Newcastle. I've got to ask you, the co-author Tony McMahon, did he have no idea where Newcastle was? Did he think it was just the other side of Watford or something? I seven hours? <laughs> I think he's new in the country. I think he's just, <laughs> he's just got his British, British citizenship. <laughs> Now, t this is called No Place to Hide, How I Put the Black in a Union Jack. And I've got to tell you, sometimes it's uncomfortable. It's an in-your-face book. And, I, and I, I don't know about you, Errol, but I'm glad you've written it now and not 20 years ago. Because you've had time to sit back, look at the situation, and you haven't spared anybody, have you, brother? This is directly from the heart. This is full of what we say in Cov, and I'm going to use the royal we. This is full of soul, this book, isn't it? Yeah, the world of book is about I means it's a hard hit book. I mean, um, the times growing up in Coventry was very hard. You know, it was a, a very tough time. We had the, the skinheads, National Front. You know, it was just a just the way we was treated them times. I was a young, I was a young lad growing up, and I, and I felt I felt all the all the reactions from people when they when they see me, the way they looked at me, the way they treated me, and I was I think I was treated very badly. But at that same time, you may have been treated badly on the street. You know, you talk about lots of skirmishes in there and having run-ins with proper skinheads. Yeah, with skinheads. But at the same time, you're winning schoolboy titles. NABC titles, junior ABA titles, boxing for young England, you know, being selected as a major representative, going unbeaten for all those years. How, w why did you let yourself get trapped on the street, or did you have no alternative, Errol? Well, there was no alternative. I mean, like, um, I, I, I love school. School was, a, was the first place I, I came, I encountered the racist, the racist feelings from school by being called Nig Nog and stuff like that. I had no place of peace. And even when I went home to my parents, my parents' home, I mean, my father wasn't, was mentally sick. Yeah. Um, my mum was, was dealing with stress. Struggling with, with how many boys? Eight, eight children all together six boys and two, two girls. girls and it was murder for her like and they're they're not really earning any money and they've got feelers all the time and clothes on us and we're all screaming at them for this and that and gets this gets that and uh it was just a tough tough life and um my, my savior was i was lucky to have things that don't happen today i had a boxing club on the corner of my street just around wow. the back Right my now. house, a boxing gym, and that was my saviour. Uh, the job boxing gym was run by a guy called Tom, Tom McGarry. McGarry. He was my saviour. The legend you know, Tom McGarry. Tom McGarry, yeah, he knew the rule book. He was a union man. Them time, union men could, could close down a whole factory. Yeah, and, and he was, and that's what he was. He was that's, one of those old right. ABA style officials that was right. an, a union man. Let me ask you this. You talk about the aggravation you had on the streets of yeah. Cobb. No different than the aggravation that, that I, I witnessed growing up in different parts of London at that exact same time, because you and I are about the same age. But did you experience any of that racism? in the world of amateur boxing let me tell you in a, uh, let me tell you if it wasn't for the world of amateur boxing i am um, you, you heard of malcolm x and these cool. powerful sort of people if it wasn't for boxing that that brought me out of my shell that took me on on uh, on travels all around every part of the country mm. i met so many um nice people not not every i thought at the time i was growing up we was a bit um, scared of white people because the way we was being treated, we was being spat at some of the times, we was being chased, chased through the streets by skinheads, we was being abused, racially abused all the time. Uh, people let their dogs on us, we walked past their house, they set their dogs on us. I mean, it was a terrible time when I was young, I remember the dogs just missing my dad's hands, he's waving the dog by the dog. Pushing it away. That's right, and the dog snapping his hands. Um, it was a terrible time, I mean, it was, I mean, it was, it was a, a really bad time, and the, the save my saviour was boxing. I was lucky that I could go to this gym and I could punch a bag, you know, I was welcome to the gym. Punch right. somebody without getting in trouble. Well, I could take my aggression out on the bag. I mean, it, it <laughs> kept me, it kept me, my, my sense of humour, part of what kept me on the straight and narrow, that kept my mind together. Now, you managed to win these 10 titles. It's a glorious time, including the senior title. Then right. you win the 
European Under-19 right. Championship. Then you turn professional, mm -hmm. and you, you don't sign with Mickey Duff. You sign right. with Bert, a guy called Bert McCarthy, and who was working closely with Frank Warren. Mm -hmm. And we fast-forward through your career, and it's going well. You suffer one setback. Mm -hmm. And then you have this incredible night, this incredible fight and this incredible night, where you come up against Mark Kayla from West Ham at Wembley. Now, this was a fight heavy with racism you and him had had a fight he'd whispered something in your ear he claims it's one thing i think we all know it's not what he says it is i'm not going to get myself sued i'm not going to say it on air but he certainly didn't say what he claims he said i'm, I'm convinced of that but it did it did the trick for him because the place was sold out mm -hmm. and it was just unbelievable now you talk about coming to talk, tell me the, the chapter on that i reread that chapter a day in a book it's unbelievable. The hairs were standing up on the back of my neck. The build up to the cater. Tell me what it was like walking out of Wembley that night with well, that sold out with West Ham fans walking out that police wall. Tell me what it was like. Well, all, all I can say is that, you know, you, I don't know if anybody's seen National Front meetings and stuff, and it's a very aggressive atmosphere. I mean, that night they let off a, a firework in the, in the audience. I mean, half my fan base wouldn't come to the fight because they was frightened. Your parents what, couldn't come, could my they? Parents, my parents wouldn't come because they it was worried about what would happen to them. You know, it was a it was a terrible time. Most of my fan base did not show up for the fight and would not come down. Mm. They didn't want to get involved in the aggro. They've, we've been the guys that followed me. They've been through so much. We was fighting all the time. I mean, just to walk into a shop. You know, without getting aggro was 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 very hard. Yeah. And uh, to to go to to go to a to a fight to, to go to a boxing show where there's going to be that there full in your face, that sort of action. I mean, it, it frightened a lot of people off. Mm. And my fan base stayed stayed at home. Stayed mostly at home because you had you and Kayla had had a couple of scraps yeah, during the press conference. One inside the press conference and the one outside, quite right. famous, where he tried to push you into a fountain. That's right. And and there was unbelievable levels of animosity lots of people are talking about it online when i told them i had you on the show and people are saying you know was there any racial tension no was there any racial tension are you mad you could cut it with an axe you could cut it with a blunt axe it was unbelievable that night it was absolutely savage now let me ask you this Harold. you have him you have marked down you catch him in the first or second round mm -hmm. and then you have him down again but you feel your legs seizing up. You're tired. Suddenly, you're, bo you're basically, you've been training since nine, nine years of age. Eight, and your body, eight or nine, your body's given up on you, isn't it? Literally in the ring, you, you're becoming aware. And it's brilliant reading how you're falling apart. That's right. That is the only part of the story because, you know, there was so many things that were going on between that. You know, in the ring that night, there was not, there was, there was, uh, it was me and Kayla, yes. But Kayla had a helping hand up. I, my, my, the way I see it, the referee was, was helping his yeah, side as well. Yeah, tell me about what the referee you know? did. Before the, this Harry Gibbs, a very old referee, old school referee. Right. Now, before the bout starts, and there's, there's evidence, evidence, in fact, Harry Carpenter, the late, great Harry Carpenter, notices it. What happens when he brings you two together? What does Harry Gibbs, tell me, again, because I'm still shocked by it, tell me what Harry Gibbs did to you. Well, people don't realise, when, I, when, I, when you go for a fight, you, it's very com confrontationist. Um, I'll come confronted him. I've got my eyes in his face. Focus only focus, on him. Focus, that's right. Only on him. You know that this one, this this is my target for these for these three minutes for how many rounds it's going to be. Yep. I'm going to be I'm be going in there. I'm going for this guy, and my concentration was blocked with a slap in my face. He slapped three. you in the face. And all all the fights I've had previous to that fight, I've always done the same thing. I've eyeballed them, and it's never been any problem. The referee's never I've never been slapped in the face. The referee knew what he'd done to me that night. When he slapped me in what, my face. Why did he do that? He knows why. So he broke your concentration? He broke my concentration. I went back to my, my own corner to touch the with my trainer, lost a little sip of water and back into the fight. Mm. But my mind went back to my trainer thinking, mm. why did my why did that referee slap me in my face? Now, and, now Errol, sorry for interrupting you. I want to get so much of this through yeah. and I want, I want people to get cat snippets of it and want to go out and buy it. No place to hide. How I put the black in the Union Jack. Errol Christie with Tony McMahon. The guy that co-wrote with him. Uh, anyway, let me ask you this: After the fight, and you miss it, oh, miss it out in a book. Did you and Kayla embrace? Were you? Did you and Kayla leave? Did you leave Wembley that night? And did Kayla leave Wembley that night with a bit of respect, and not necessarily as friends, but did you part on half decent terms? You can tell the truth. You have done in the book. Never. Well, I never parted on half. I never even like we we parted in the ring. That's the last I seen him until we had a press conference. Wow. And we had to. Uh, that was it. But uh, as far as I was concerned, you know... Now, that, that's interesting, because we've managed to track down, if I'm not mistaken, Mark Kayla. We've got a clip from Mark Kayla talking to a colleague of Tony McMahon's. This is what Mark Kayla said just recently in California. 
If I had a choice between a rematch, Harold Christie, and a cup of coffee, I'd go to the rematch first. Um, he would come here to California anytime he wanted to. We'd co lock the doors, get in the ring, shake hands on the Marquis of Queensby rules, and last man standing. Then we'd have a cup of coffee after that. That's Mark Kayla, 25 years on or whatever it is. But he's talking about after Queensbury rules. I mean, he was hitting me after the belt. Yeah. He was hitting me. With beef. He was hitting. He was doing unfair things. I mean, I was a clear cut fighter. Mm. I, I stick to the rules. I never, I never, I never abused any rules in the ring. Mm. I never have done. Never ever did. 